So welcome everyone. Um, in today's talk, we are going to deep dive into something quite known, which is the server-side template injection. But since it's known for a few years, um, server-side template injections have never been properly researched in order to optimize uh, to the byte uh, the payloads. And I'm going to present to you a new approach to find payloads for server-side template injections uh, in JinJ2, but can be applied in other techniques. Uh, in order to find short payloads for pen testing uh, server-side template injection vulnerabilities. So I'm Remy Gascou. I'm a senior security researcher. I work in uh, a lot of different fields. Uh, most of the time I do pen tests. And in my free time with my own company called Podiris Labs, I'm doing research, which is entirely in open source uh, um, when I publish it. And uh, it's on my GitHub, so if you are interested in other domains, now I'm talking about server-side template injection in a web application, but I'm also really interested in Active Directory and Windows. So if you like that too, uh, check out my GitHub. Uh, so server-side template injection vulnerabilities are um, a class of attacks that we do see for uh, more than 10 years now. And uh, we do see it a lot in a lot of technologies. And we are going in this talk to deep dive into JinJ2 because it's the most uh, widely known and it's used in CTFs and um, can be seen in lots of places. So first of all, we are going to check out what is SSTIs, uh, how Python internal works and how we can use introspection in order to, uh, to optimize payloads. And we are going to see how we can apply graph theory in order to find the most optimized and more, the shortest payloads possible. And uh, at the end of this talk, I'll give you a few, um, a few payloads that is a teasing on the same technique for a Mako engine, uh, which is used uh, by Reddit, for example. So uh, first of all, the server-side template injection vulnerabilities happens when uh, a template engine is used. Uh, the template engine is um, a kind of uh, software. It can be anything. In this case, it's for web servers, but it's not always for web servers. It's a software that's used uh, to um, render data inside a template. You have a template, which is always the same, and you have data, which is, for example, the user profile, and that will be rendered inside the template. So, for example, in, this in the case of um, web servers, it is a template will be the HTML page with all the CSS and all the classes, and in the data, you will have only the user profile, and once it's rendered, you will have the full, um, the full page for your user. And uh, this is done by the template engine. So there is a lot of template engines. In Python, the four main template engines are uh, Django, JinJ2, Mako, and Genshi. Uh, because it's important to note that Django has an internal template engine, which is not the same as JinJ2. Sometimes people uh, tend to, to mix the two. And we are going to deep dive in JinJ2. So, for those of you that uh, do not know what is uh, a template in JinJ2, it looks like this. So basically, uh, in the case of an HTML file, you will have HTML code and uh, uh, between curly brackets, you will have uh, some, um, some uh, tags that will be used by the template engine in order to know where to put the data. Uh, in order to, uh, to do tests, you can uh, use the template engine in command line if you don't want to uh, set up a whole web server in order to test your payloads. So if you import JinJ2 inside um, a Python interpreter, uh, you, can on, you can just uh, import it, uh, import the template object, which is the template engine of JinJ2, it's the core of JinJ2. Uh, you can instantiate this object with a string template, uh, just in one line, and call dot render, it's a function that will render the template with the arguments that you want. And in here, we have, a, we have rendered a small, a small and simple template uh, to, to replace just a name. Uh, for those of you that are um, familiar with the, the uh, system for automated pen testing and automated pen test reports, most of them are using template engines. And uh, for example, Python docx is uh, widely used. So if we get back to our template, uh, we can see uh, that our objects can also be used in order to iterate on it. For example, here I have a navigation list, which is passed to the template. And inside the template, the template engine knows with these tags that it, it, it will iterate on the, the content of this list. Uh, 
So this means that there is a lot more than just uh, a simple replace that is happening inside the template engine, but we do have logic that is happening inside the template, and we can leverage it in order to uh, execute payloads, for example. So um, when we have uh, SSTI, the first question we have is how we can execute code on the remote machine. In Python, this question is often is often um, reduced to how we can we access the OS module because when we access the OS module, we can execute shell commands. And um, up to this day, there was a lot of payloads that were published on Jinja2, but most of them were highly context dependent, like this one. Uh, uh, for example, this one is a payload that uh, does work perfectly, but you have to find the correct index of the uh, OS module. And this index is not the same in all the applications, in all the versions of NJ2. You will have to brute force or to, uh, to list uh, indexes before creating um, this payload. So I wondered, uh, are there other payloads in NJ2 templates that are not uh, commonly known? Uh, ideally, I want one that is context-free, which means there is no data in the dot .render function, uh, nothing needed, and if we can, shorter. So to do this, before exploring graphs, we do need to know how we can uh, see what is happening inside the Python BM. And for this, we have something really cool called um, Python introspection, because Python is um, a language that is highly object-oriented. Most of uh, the variables are not variables. They are objects in Python. Even integers are objects. And uh, we can do introspection on them. So for example, in Python, if we, if we use the dear function, uh, we can uh, list all the attributes of a Python object, and uh, we can see them, see the name of the attributes of this object. And since everything is an object in Python, we can do the same on the uh, child attributes. So for example, if we take the integer zero, we do dear, we find the init function. If we do a, a dear on this init function, we do see the attributes of the init function. So this allows us to trace paths in order to, to connect objects uh, all together in a chain. <clears throat> uh, for example, if we do take a module, because modules are also objects in Python, if we take the root module, we do import jinj2. Jinj2, this, this name is now a, mod, uh, it's a module, but it's an object inside the Python VM. We can access its sub-properties, and we can access sub-modules, and we can eventually find um, the OS module some somewhere in the, um, the code of the module. This is possible by hand, but it's extremely tedious, and uh, I do not encourage you to do it by hand, because it's really long and really useless. <clears throat> but we can do it. If we take this path and uh, we represent all the choices we can uh, do for each step, we can see it's basically a tree that uh, will start from our root object with all the choices that we'll have to make. And uh, we can then, uh, if we do see it as a tree, we can explore it uh, with graph algorithms or tree algorithms um, to find shortest path to the OS module or to any, uh, any interesting object. So to do this, we, uh, we will apply basic graph algorithms. Uh, we can use depth-first search, but it does not serve our purpose since we want to find the shortest path. Uh, depth-first search will need to perform all the search of all the, um, the layers of the graph before it will find it. Uh, breadth-first search will be the best uh, idea because it will explore the tree layer by layer. And since we want the shortest path to the OS module, it will be um, the best to use. And breadth-first search is what we use in France uh, to find bread. So, uh, yeah, so we will use breadth first search so uh, we can use the shortest path first because it's the whole point of, uh, of doing this automatically to find uh, short payloads. Uh, if we do illustrate it, uh, for example, if we take object one as a basis, um, we'll see that when we explore it in breadth first search, we will obviously find the shortest path because we are doing it layer by layer. So once we have find, uh, found the shortest path, we know that it's the shortest because we have explored all the tree layer by layer. So in this example, object one has an attribute. This attribute is referring to the OS module. So we found uh, a path of length two that uh, starts from our object one. 
The problem with this approach is that uh, there is some trickery inside Python, and uh, the Python object tree is not actually a tree. That's uh, the main problem. And there is something called cyclic traps, which is, you can see the whole Python VM as a tree, but sometimes the tree re refers to itself. So it's a, a tree-shaped graph. <laughs> it's not technically a tree. And uh, if we do not keep um, an index of what we have explored, we will explore it infinitely, and it's not what we want. So in this example, object one is referring to object one. It's something that we do see really often because there is one attribute inside the Python object which is called, which is called underscore underscore self and can refer to one of its parents or to himself. So it, it's something that happens a lot. And the other problem is multiple exploration time, uh, multiple exploration and therefore long exploration time because uh, most objects are declared a lot of time inside the Python VM. It can be uh, uh, it, it can be for multiple reasons. The most basic reason is that Python optimizes a lot of stuff, and for example, uh, all the integers between minus five to two hundred and fifty-five are pre uh, pre declared by Python uh, inside the Python VM. When you start an interpreter, they are pre declared, and if you do an integer that is below minus five or more than uh, two hundred and fifty-five. Uh, Python will create a new object each time you call this integer. And you can verify it with the ID function. If you do ID of zero, you will have always the same address. But if you do ID of 433, uh, you will have a different address each time you call it. Because a new object is created. So we need to keep track of the objects that we do use in order to uh, be able to find the shortest path without exploring multiple times uh, the, the objects. So to do this, we are using the id function, which is a function in Python that allows to uh, find the memory address of our object. Uh, it's not technically perfect because the, there can be collision, but we will, we will uh, assume that your application is not big enough. You do, you do not have hundreds of millions of, of objects declared in, inside it. And uh, therefore, there should not be any collisions. But in the case of a really huge application with hundreds of millions of objects and multi-threads, uh, then you can have some false positives. <clears throat> so if we do implement this as a first proof of concept, uh, we can find paths from the Jinja to module two uh, OS modules, or any sub-module, actually. Uh, here, there are a lot of uh, um, integrated module in Python. So this is really interesting, but for now, we are from the root of the module. It's not really interesting since uh, we want to call it from inside the template, and we do not have access to the jinj 2 uh, variable inside the template. So these ones are filtered. It's only the uh, path to OS, so there is multiple, so it's quite cool. Good start. But to, to, to go further, we need to be able to do this introspection from inside the render of the template. So there is two options for this. Uh, one is to do uh, some uh, some crappy patch uh, in order to 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 patch the template engine of Jinj2, and the other is to write a Python library. That's what I did. So you can use it not only in Jinj2 but also on other projects. Uh, so Object Walker is a Python library that does exactly this. Everything that is presented in this talk. Uh, we have a lot of filters, uh, so you can filter not only on modules, but also on certain objects. And you can use it in command line if you want to do the first part of this talk and to trust uh, um, paths from a module to another module, you can do this. Uh, here is the list of the, the ways to access the OS module from the Jinja2 root uh, up to a depth of 15. And you can also do it inside and programmatically like a library inside the Python code, which is what we want to explore the insides of Jinj2. So if we do this, for example, uh, we will uh, explore the sys module from uh, a Python script and uh, we can add some um, filters if you want. Uh, so for example, here it's uh, uh, a few lines of Python. Every, everything is on my GitHub if you need to, if you need that for CTF. But this one is a few lines of object workers that will automatically find all the paths 
to the objects that contain a regular expressions in their value that do match uh, the flag format of a CTF. So it will find the, for, uh, for example, in the challenge, the, uh, there was a server-side template injection in Django. And with that, we were able to, f to solve two challenges in five seconds because we were able to compute the whole path without even thinking about the challenge. So really interesting if you are doing uh, CTFs. And if we do apply our graph theory in GNJ2, we first have to find a base object. And the base object we will have to use is called self. It's uh, an object that is already defined inside the template between the curly brackets. It's always there. It will never get patched. And uh, it's basically how GNJ2 works. So it has to be there. If we do render it, we see this object is a template reference. Uh, the template reference is an object inside GNJ2 that holds all the, uh, the content of the context of the template. For example, uh, the template reference will hold the variables that you will declare, but also all the internals of the template that allow the template engine to uh, interact with it. So we will start from this object since it's always there, so it's context free, and that's what we want. <coughs> if we do explore it, uh, we can see we can uh, use functions on it. If we do render and we declare a function here, we can access this variable inside the template so we can call it on uh, the uh, function, uh, on the uh, self object. So for example, if we do f equals to dear uh, in the render function, in the render function, inside the template, we will be able to call our object f since it's passed inside the template. And if we do explore it, we see there is a lot of, uh, lot of attributes. And there is one attribute that is uh, private in Python. But in Python, uh, to create uh, private attributes, you have to, uh, inside your class, to uh, name your variable with two underscores um, at the start. But when you do this, they are not actually private. It will just add, before your two underscores, underscore, the class name, underscore, underscore, and the name of your variable. So it's not technically private, but it's just harder to, to get there if you don't uh, see it. So here, we have a private attribute that is actually uh, accessible, uh, which is a template reference context. And if we, get, if we deep dive into this and we print this, its content, we'll see that it's a, a dictionary object with uh, lots of objects that are used inside the template. And uh, in these objects, we see that there is uh, functions, there is classes, and there is classes that are uh, declared inside JinJ2. So inside JinJ2.utils, we have three classes that are uh, declared here. But since we found a path to OS that is also declared inside utils, we will be able probably to escape from this uh, from these uh, classes that are already declared inside the template in order to access the module that is inside this file. So in order to do this, we will use a really classic technique that is often used in CTFs, uh, which is called the dot init dot globals. Basically, what what is happening is in Python, when you create an object, um, you use the init function. It's often not, uh, it's something that does uh, the Python does internally. You don't call it uh, by hand. And when you have an object, if you call dot underscore underscore init, you access to the object of the function that created the object. And if you go dot underscore underscore globals, you will access the dictionary of the global variables that uh, this function has uh, when uh, the object was created. So in our case, uh, if we do this on the objects that were declared inside the utils module of JinJ2, we will access the global variables of the, the class. And since in, in the, the utils file there was import OS on the first line, we will have access directly to the OS module. So the full path looks like this. Uh, it's really better since it's not context dependent, but uh, we can maybe do better. So uh, if we try to optimize it, we'll see that there is actually three classes that are declared inside utils. So if we take all of them, we can access all of them. Uh, this is the three classes that are declared. And uh, the really interesting thing is that since they are 
we were able to find it because we explored the objects, but they are already declared inside the template. That's why they, they became uh, seeable inside the template reference context. So we can just get rid of the self dot un underscore template reference context because they are already there inside the template. So we have three payloads that are really, really cool now because they are way shorter. They work all the time, not in sandboxed environments because if you are able to bypass sandboxed environments, uh, you are you are supposed to get CVE, but uh, JinJ2 will not patch this uh, if you are inside a normal environment of JinJ2, which is 99% of the applications that use it. And uh, so these work all the time. They are always there, and they are uh, because th they are there because of JinJ2, uh, how JinJ2 works. But can we do better? Uh, yeah, we do because what we see inside the template reference context is. Besides the classes that were declared inside the utils module, we also see uh, that there is a function called lipsum, which is used to generate lorem ipsum. And uh, this function is uh, declared also inside a file that do does use OS. But since it's a function in Python, you do not need the underscore underscore init to access it gl its globals. You can go there directly. So uh, the path is shorter of one element, and uh, you can remove the underscore underscore in it. So this is actually the shortest payload that you can ever find for JinJ2 up to this day. Uh, it should be the shortest if, the, if there is no change in the code base. And it will always be activated, not in sandbox environments. It's technically activated inside sandbox environments, but you cannot access it. Um, there is a small teasing if you do the same research on a Mako template engine, which is a, a template engine used by Reddit, for example. Uh, we can find 54 direct paths to the OS module uh, doing this. If you want, there is a full article on my website that explains the whole technique. Uh, but basically, we, these are the, the payloads that we can find uh, at the end. So if you do encounter uh, Mako templates inside your pen test, I've never seen one, but if you do, uh, there is the shortest payload that you can use all the time to access the OS module. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed this talk. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, in the case of SSTI, uh, can you also use uh, built-in Python functions like eval or exec? Uh, you could use it, but you need to find uh, the way to, uh, uh, th there's, two, there's two options. Uh, if they are already inside the render function, it means that you can access them from within the template, but it's never the case, almost. But you can uh, exec and eval code if you find the path to the exec function or the eval function. So you could use this research to find a path to an exec or eval function, and then use it to eval the code that we want, you want. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, so, so this is the first time I hear about the SSTIs. I was wondering how we can, I don't know, as developers, protect against these attacks? Um, these attacks are not supposed to happen because um, for them to happen, the attacker needs to control the template that is inside the template engine. Normally, uh, when code is well written, the template is only controlled by the developer and it's uh, in a file on a server or in, on a database. But sometimes um, it, it happens, for example, when, when two teams of developers use the same code base but do, do not use the same technologies, sometimes uh, the data will get modified inside the control path. So for example, um, in the case of an email that gets sent, uh, for example, the first team creates the email with a beautiful template. The second team creates another template for the signature. The two gets put together and it gets rendered two times. So the first one is rendered, the second one is rendered. If the attacker puts data on the first one, it will get rendered and it will be just simple text. So there is no impact on just this base. But with the second step, since it's rendered, um, uh, it's all also rendered, uh, you will render what the attacker has put in the first state. So sometimes the template gets messy because developers do not uh, <laughs> use templates that, like they should. Okay, thank you, I understand.